my whole life savings have gone into the business um, and I continue just to put my body and soul into the business every day. So when now I'm faced with this, okay, well, what do I do with all this stock that I have? And I guess the answer is I've got to be completely brutal. I've, you know, like I've got to get inventive for one um, and find a market. But, I'm, you know, my window is, is quickly vanishing before my eyes because the, the, the product is seasonal. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. The rock oyster is a truly unique shellfish, indigenous not only to Australia, but to New South Wales too. As the COVID pandemic has affected many in the industry, the suppliers are also hurting. Uh, many of them, especially the small producers, have no avenue to sell their produce anymore because all the restaurants and cafes have been limited to takeaway or been forced to close. The rock oyster is unique in that it's a luxury item. It's up there with caviar and lobster. And when we think of oysters, often we think of eating in restaurants. And so the impact on farmers, who are often pretty small family-run businesses, is monumental. John Blankenstein owns Mimosa Rock Oysters, surrounded by uninhabited Australian native bushland. It's a spectacular place in Australia. John's with us now. John, how are you going? Good, thanks, Huck. How is... Um, the last couple of weeks shaped up for you and can you just sort of take us through the impact that this uh, COVID-19 has had on on your business? Yeah, sure, mate. Well, it's been a tumultuous year to um, to call it out. Um, you know, obviously dealing with the bushfires and um, then subsequent flooding and now with um, the COVID-19, it's, um, it's pretty much just stopped everything um as it was um we were greatly reduced in our ability to to do any harvesting and and with um, rock oysters in particular where we grow them it's quite seasonal so the window um for selling is is quite small Uh, we normally um, generally try and do a bit of selling around um december this year, I was only doing market um, sales through Carriage Works in Sydney, but uh, we really gear up in January and February. Um, and unfortunately, um, due to the natural events, we weren't able to do that. I remember seeing on Instagram you were um, you put some videos up, sort of saying showing uh, you'd put all this piping and sprinklers over your sheds, and you know, literally the flames were like coming down on you. Yeah, absolutely. So. Um, so luck would have it, I I'd planned a trip to South Australia to catch up with some growers over there and um, and industry folk, and I'd just gotten over there, um, just driven three days to get to Port Lincoln and Cow area, and um, and then I saw the fires near me up flared up on my phone, telling me there was a, a fire in my you know localized area. So I sat there nervously and watched it for. Um, 24 to 48 hours before having to pull the pin on that trip and drive 48 hours non-stop across um, three states to get home um, in order to you know prepare the the farm and the and the house for the um, real threat of fire in the in the local catchment um, fortunately for us though um, we were spared um, so that's a win let's talk about sort of what's happening now obviously oysters are pretty special and particularly the rock oyster and a majority of your oysters would go through the restaurant trade can you can you tell us what impact it's had on you in the last couple of weeks yeah sure so the way we're geared up at mimosa is um and probably like most oyster farmers is that um it's a oyster oyster farm it's a scale of economy so you, you really need the key is to grow. We really need to grow a lot of oysters, sell a lot of oysters to make to cover costs. Um, so, um, you know, with the closure of um, restaurants, essentially, that's pretty much shut us down overnight. Because whether we're selling to wholesalers or or, or um, direct sales um, to chefs, um, if basically we don't have um, people seating in a restaurant 
then we're not moving product. Um, and that's, um, that's it in a nutshell. Can you give us, like you were just saying the, about the volumes required in order to make money because, you know, oyster farmers are f- small family run businesses all across Australia. You know, what sort of volumes are we talking about? And can you kind of paint a picture of the average day for an oyster farmer from sort of when you get started to getting back to the shed? Yeah, sure. All right. Well, um, like, like all farming, oyster farming is um, is a job that, you know, has multiple, multiple tasks to its day. Um, I guess where to start with oyster farming is, is it, you need to recognise that it's a, that it's a long term cycle um, to grow out an oyster. So essentially, um, it's not so much where the day starts; it's it's where the cycle starts. So, you know, for me at Mimosa, it takes me pretty much three and a half to four years to to grow out a rock oyster, and in that time, um, I'm constantly um, carrying out. Um, work on the farm, on and off the farm, constantly grading, sorting through oysters, um, putting in infrastructure, um, doing maintenance work, um, working around tides, um, you know, seasonal issues, um, hot days, floods, whatever. Um, we're, we're, you know, we're all out there um, at all hours of the day. It's not a, it's not a, you know, Seven to three thirty type of job or a nine to five. It's there really um, there really are no days off in this game. Um, so I guess you know on any given day, um, you know I try and start relatively early. You know, alarm goes off at about five, um, and up the shed just sorting and getting organised um, for the day. Uh, usually um, requires a, at least one trip out to the lake um, and in that time I'm more or less just um, grading over, bringing stock in and out. And it's constantly the ro- rotation of stock, you know, that, that hands-on husbandry that's key um, to growing a good oyster um, and seeing how your oysters are performing in different paddocks. And and just, you know, over time I guess you just you developed a, a sixth sense um, one with – your specific environment, your water, and and so you know you're sort of directed by environmental cues um, and seasonal cues as to you know the the, the tasks that are um, set for the day. When I was talking to Annie Smithers, she was sort of saying the problem for producers is that produce keeps growing, and you know they they need a solution for it. And you're sort of talking about three to four years for an oyster to grow, so. Obviously, you've got a lot ready to go and nowhere to put them. So, what's, what sort of volumes are we talking about, and and what are the solutions at the moment? Yeah. Okay. So, at, like at Mimosa, I currently um, try and market um, anywhere from twenty to thirty thousand dozen oysters a year. Um, now, that twenty to thirty can can fluctuate depending on. Um, just you know, on on condition being seasonal, whether it's ready to go at the right time, or obviously um, environmental, and then um, these um, type of scenarios in which we find ourselves in. So um, yeah, so I, I guess um, I guess for me personally, that yeah, the volume I need to say to sell to sell to you know remain financial really is is you know is is kind of around twenty thousand dozen a year um, to cover to cover costs you know like I, I guess one of one of the great things about oyster farming is yeah sure it's um it's a lifestyle thing but it's 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 arduous and it's a labour of love like. You know, I wish I had a, a dollar for every hour I work because I'd be retired by now. So, um, it's it's one of those it's one of those things. It's 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 volume based. You know what I mean? And and I and I guess and I guess it, it's you know if we can't sell volume, then essentially um, you know we can't make ends meet. When you think about it, it it takes me three to four years to grow out 
one individual oyster. It's 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 a living entity. You know, it's it's alive. Um, and at that, you know, duration of its life or grow out period that you know I'm calling three and a half four years. You know, I get to market, and at best, if I'm value adding, I'll get a dollar sixty for that oyster. So, but in that time, you know, I've I've painstakingly nurtured, you know, ran and we, like nurtured that oyster through its life. You know, it's ran the gauntlet of um, all. You know, like it's it's life through the um, the the estuary. You know, like it, it, there's. There's a myriad of things that can go wrong and can kill an oyster. Um, I'm pretty good at killing them, but um, <laughs> but you know you, you hope at the end when when you get there that you know you you've got something um, f- as you've you've got something to sell and so you can get a return. But one of the biggest problems we're facing now is that it's it's a rotational thing, and at Mimosa, I'm not really looking to get any bigger and to invest. Too much more, as in um, for infrastructure into the into the business because it's it's I've I've invested so heavily in it. You know, my whole life savings have gone into the business, um, and I continue just to put my body and soul into the business every day. So when now I'm faced with this, okay, well, what do I do with all this stock that I have? And I guess the answer is. I've got to be completely brutal. I've, you know, like I've got to get inventive for one, um, and find a market. But I'm, you know, my window is is quickly vanishing before my eyes because the 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 product is seasonal, and when the water comes in cold or we have, say, a late spawn, um, and that coincides with the cooling of the water currents, then it's going to be very difficult for me to fatten an oyster and to sell oysters in any type of volume so I have all these other oysters coming through that need to be brought through for next year's um, harvest so basically I just have to make the decision where um, unless I can unless I find some money or are willing to in, invest in more um, more gear and, and, and infrastructure which is is problematic too because it requires more time than of, of, of my already time poor schedule, um, then I've just got to make the decision um, to cull the tail end, I suppose, and, and that means either giving them away or throwing them away. And that's that's just a brutal reality, isn't it? It's just a horrible thought for so many producers. And particularly, I know right now you're uh, you were talking about oysters being seasonal, and yours are—it's prime time right now for your oysters. And you know they—they're like beautiful, plump, ready to eat, and they need to get out there, and so people can enjoy them. Yeah, absolutely. Um, today's to probably be the um, the peak of the season for um, for mimosa. Um, right now, they're unbelievably um, fat. They're in um, the best condition they could possibly be. So you know, as far as an oyster goes, you know this is this is their prime time, and and they're wanting to shine. Unfortunately, um, we can't get them out there, but um, in the volumes that we would like. But but in saying that, we 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 can still get them out there. You know, like we we get them out the door direct harvest uh, next day delivery, um, and it's about letting people know that you know you can still enjoy great rock oysters um and you can get them delivered to your door that's it's no problem it's no challenge for us it's what we do every day it's what we do to restaurants you know sure you're not going to a restaurant now but that doesn't mean you can't enjoy the finer things in life like good oysters you know they're so good for you they're a superfood you know that when you think about oysters you know i i just i just get overwhelmed with how brilliant they are you know they're they're hundreds of thousands of years old you know like they predate they predate us you know they've they've been around on this great continent for ever and a day and you know they and they just continue day in day out to do their thing and right now they're you know they're just absolutely amazing and and there's you know it wouldn't be a better time than right now than 
and to enjoy a rock oyster. Why did you become an oyster farmer? How did you uh, get into the industry? And you're clearly very passionate about it. Yeah. Well, I got into oyster farming purely for lifestyle. Like from growing up from an early age, I've always been um, immersed in the supernatural. You know, I, I love being outside. I, I love, you know, the wind in my hair and, and you know, salt water <clears throat> and, all, and, all, and all the um, adventures that, that, you know, come with – being outside, and and I and I guess I'm a plumber by trade, and and you know that's been very kind to me. But I got to a point in my life where I needed something a bit more than like personally, um, and there was a sense of of aching, I guess, inside. So that led me to you know sort of oyster farming. Um, you know, I always had an interest in aquaculture. I've got a uh, also got a background in environmental. Nas, uh, sorry, natural resource management, um, where I, you know, I studied um, for a while and 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 did that. Um, so you know, it's there's always been um, an attraction to you know to the natural world and being outside. And when an opportunity um, came to um, have enough finances to buy an oyster farm, then. Then I, I jumped. Uh, I jumped um, headfirst into it. You know, there was a time, <laughs> approximately fifteen years ago, <laughs> I was down at Wappingo for my bucks um, party actually, and I was buying some oysters off the uh, an old an old chap right at the end of the end of the lake, and that was um, pre Warwick Anderson Kingfisher, and the old bloke said to me, "Listen, mate, I'll sell you the oyster lease," and and at the time I was I was so fired up. You know, he only wanted eighty thousand dollars. A shed and about five or six hectares and I went home and I told the wife and she pretty much looked at me and said you're dreaming um but at that stage she'd known a lot of oyster farmers and 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 the game was a lot different back then just stick and try it was hard work still still hard work but um but you know it's 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 got a lot easier and and, and with you know technology and infrastructure um advancements it's 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 definitely become um a better game to be in but yeah, so essentially that was all about lifestyle. But I, but 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 I'll tell you, I've never worked so hard in my life. So, <laughs> but but I'm happy. Like I I, re- I really am happy, you know, with with my choice, you know, and 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 I think with with mimosa too, or any type of farming, you know, like sure, it's it's fucking hard work, Huck. But you know, there's a great sense of pride that 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 comes in producing something that that is produced through a bit of struggle where you've got to have a bit of dog in you and you know when you know when you're on your back you know and and you know you're down for at least one or two counts but you're not out you know it's all about getting up and 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 taking the bull by the horns and and getting a bit of mongrel in you so I guess you know like sure we're on shit times now but you know I think you know I can walk around with my you know head in my lap and be pessimistic but you know the show goes on you know there is a lot to be grateful for I go out to work and you know I'm surrounded in this beautiful environment and you know at the very least well I get to eat shit hot oysters 365 days a year (laughs) you know I'd love to share those oysters with greater Australia but you know so you know come on you know get behind and your local oyster farmer but um yeah you know it's 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 one of those things you know I just yeah, it's um, I think I think the I think the game kind of chooses you. You know what I mean? It's it's not for everyone, um, and I and I guess and I guess that kind of kind of where I'm at. Well, and you're living off grid, and you know you you said that you're really happy. Can you tell us about the environment you're in, and and what makes your oysters so special? Yeah, sure. All right. Well, me and my family reside on a forty acre property. Um, within the Mimosa Rocks National Park. We're bordered by the park on, on three sides and on the fourth side is my neighbour. Um, and then he's bordered by the park. Um, so I reside in a very small locality called Nelson um, and you're probably familiar with Nelson Lake. 
which is, um, you know, being championed by Tartha Oysters, Gary Rodley, for many years. It's probably the most awarded, it, well, it is the most awarded estuary in Australia and, and, and um, it's renowned for producing the best oysters in the world. So I'm lucky enough to call this place home and I'm lucky enough to farm um, a couple of hectares on that, on that estuary as well as um, a further five hectares in Wapango, which also is within, located within the boundaries of the Mimosa Rocks National Park. So it's, it's a very unique and, and beautiful part of the world, absolutely. And what does a natural environment, you know, what are the impacts on on your particular oyster? Because rock oysters are pretty amazing in the sense that they're very representative of the estuary that they're grown in. Um, can you tell us sort of what your oyster, particular oyster um, tastes like? Well, like there's, I, I like to think mimosa in, in, in my mind when I have an oyster, you know, I, I try and encourage people to, to you know, to close their eyes and, and, and to think about the environment and and then I like to talk about the taste that they may you know they may be experiencing but but at mimosa the oysters I, I grow I feel have um, like a, a mild salty brine um, and when in season the the oyster is is voluptuous and, and, and creamy but it has a very unique umami um, finish with it with light mineralization um but that umami that um sixth sense it's it's very like it it can, it can mean a lot to different people but for me it's just a very well balanced well finished oyster that resonates on the palate long after you've had it and you know you 20 minutes later you know you, you're still enjoying that 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 f- flavor burst that it came from that came from that oyster tastes like the sea well, one of the things that people need at the moment is is sort of feeling normal again but being uplifted and things like champagne and oysters can do that and obviously people's budgets are pretty limited but the reality is is that oysters if they're getting direct from you which is something that you're doing at the moment so you can um freight them to people you know uh, if they want to order through you, is that it's not that expensive. Fifteen dollars for a dozen oysters is uh, affordable for for quite a few people at the moment. And um, I don't know about you, but when I eat oysters, it, it's just a moment of reflection and and look, things are going to be okay for just a moment, just to take you away from things. Yeah, I think it's key with with anything um, you know in in life. If you you know you you've got to have a few simple pleasures, and I think. Oysters are would fall into that bracket as a as a simple pleasure. I, you know, I think at at fifteen dollars a dozen, that's a bloody absolute bargain. You know, you think how much you pay for a bread roll down the local bakery. No offence to bakers. Um, <laughs> shout out to you bakers. Um, but with you know, it's 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 a fine food. You know, and and it, and it's been painstakingly cared and reared for four years, and it's the culmination of all those things. The environment. A shitload of hard work, a lot of love and emotion, and and you know and 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 it's you know finally gets to be celebrated you know by the consumer where wherever that you know wherever that is and right now it's it's in the comfort of your own home with family family and friends so you know I would encourage um, everyone to consider. Um, buying some oysters off your local oyster farmer because not only are they great for you emotionally but um, physically they're, they're fantastic for you. They're, they're just high in all all the right things that you need for your body. They're Like I, I think I mentioned earlier, they're, they're a superfood. So, you know, like, yeah, definitely get an oyster into you for sure. <laughs> and um you know one of the greatest uh things you can teach yourself in my opinion is how to shuck an oyster and um if you don't know how to shuck an oyster now since you're at home is a pretty good time to give it a crack you know is there a, is there um some tips that you have or do you have an online video or something that people can see and on top of that like how do people get in contact with you to to get oysters because i know that as you say you, they should support their local you know oyster producer because they're not very expensive, but um, how they get in contact with you? 
the best way to get in contact with me, you can check us out on Instagram. I'm currently in the process of um, trying to set up an online store on the website. But as I mentioned, as I say to everyone, either direct message me on Instagram. There's access to my, my phone number or email me. Just um, pick up the phone and give us a call. Never too busy to chat. Um, and that's that's probably the best way. Like I'm, I'm always... Um, yeah, always responding to messages and emails. So, and in in relation to shucking oysters, no, it's not difficult. Um, where there's a will, there's a way, and it's quite liberating once you learn to pop the hinge on a on a on a rock oyster, and um, then you know the sky's the limit after that. Yeah, they're pretty magic when they're fresh like that. It's a pretty an experience that's pretty hard to beat. I think so, and you know as. As we mentioned, you know, like oysters are amazing right now and to have that facility where you can have oysters on tap at home, live and fresh, that's that's the best way. And there's a lot of myths and misconceptions about the storage of oysters but, you know, they're incredibly robust creatures and, and essentially if you receive your oysters live, which um, will be the way we send them, we recommend a shelf life of 5 to 11 days but the optimum temperature for an oyster Huck is somewhere between 11 to 21 degrees, but just as long as you try and maintain a constant temperature. And if you, you do all those things, then you can pretty much have, you know, the freshest oyster on tap whenever you like it, you know, whether it's, you know, flicking the lid on a frothy cold beer or winding down in the missus, you know, at home or or just sitting around the, the barbecue or, or, you know, listening to some music. Like, you know, oysters are... Uh, for everyone, they're for all Australians, and and right now couldn't be a better time than to get a rock oyster into you, mate. I love that. I certainly will be doing that. Listen, I know that um, times are a bit tough, and you're pretty busy trying to get the oysters out there. But um, awesome to chat, and uh, let's catch up again. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for your time, Huck, and um, I'd like to thank the people out there in our great nation. Thanks for supporting. Um, Australian farmers and producers and artisans. Keep it up. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Stay tuned as we share the stories of Australia's hospo community, suppliers and producers in search of hope during this pandemic. Special thanks to executive producer Rob Locke for making this all happen. Stay safe, isolate and be well.